Hi, in this module we're going to continue talking about the multiple comparison problem in fMRI. In particular, we're going to focus on methods that correct for the family-wise error rate. So, the family-wise error rate is the probability of making one or more type 1 errors in the family of tests under the null hypothesis. And a type 1 error is when we reject the null hypothesis when we really shouldn't have done that. So there are a number of family-wise error rate controlling methods that are used in neuroimaging. They include the classic Bonferroni correction, random field theory, and permutation tests. In this module, I'll talk a little bit about Bonferroni correction and random field theory. Now let's let H0 of i be the hypothesis that there's no activation in voxel i, where i can take values from 1 to m, where m is the total number of voxels. So basically, H0 i is just the, the voxel-wise null hypothesis of no activation. And now let's let Ti be the test statistic at voxel i. So we've conducted a test of the null hypothesis at each voxel, so we have T of i, and th those are the values that make up our statistical map. Now the family-wise null hypothesis, which I'm just going to call H0 here, state that there's no activation in any of the M voxels. So basically we're just assuming that there's no activation anywhere across the brain. If this is true, then H0 is true. So for H0 to be true, there has to be activation in none of the areas. And so mathematically we can write this as the intersection of the H0 of I's. So the H0 has to be true in each I, in each voxel. So if we reject a single voxel null hypothesis, we're going to reject the family-wise null hypothesis. So because basically if, all the, if any of the null hypotheses are, the individual null hypotheses are rejected, then the family-wise null hypothesis is also rejected. So a false positive at any voxel will give a family-wise error. So let's assume that the, that, that the family-wise null hypothesis is true. Then we want to control the probability of falsely rejecting H0 at some level alpha. So basically what we want to do here is we want to control the probability that any of the test statistics at any of the voxels over the entire brain is above some value u. And so we want, because if it's above u, we're going to reject that particular, the null hypothesis at that voxel, and we don't want to do that, because then we're going to get a false positive. So basically, we want to make the probability that, that Ti is bigger than u, make that controlled by some value alpha, say 0.05. So what we need to find is find the value of u which controls the family-wise error rate at this particular level. So the Bonferroni correction is the classic way of doing that. And so in Bonferroni correction, we choose the threshold u so that the probability that any of these test statistics is above u is less than alpha over m, where m is the total number of voxels. So if this is true, then this controls the family-wise error rate as well, because we can write the, the family-wise error rate as the probability that any of the test statistics is above u, which according to Boole's inequality is the sum that any of them are above u, which according to the threshold that we choose is controlled by alpha. So the Bonferroni correction, this little simple math, shows that, that it controls the family-wise error rate at alpha. So for example, if we have 10 tests and we want to control the family-wise error rate at 0.05, then we should, control each, we should choose U so that each test is controlled at 0.005. Uh, and now, if we have 100,000 tests, we need to divide by 100,000. So the, 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 the threshold will, will become increasingly stringent as, as we do more and more tests. So here's an example. Let's say that we generate uh, just IED normal zero one d data, so, so over a hundred by hundred grid. So we, in this case, we have ten thousand, you know, pseudo voxels here, each that follow a standard normal distribution. And so here's a picture of that. Now, if we threshold this at u equal to one point six four five, this would be the ninety fifth uh, percentile of the standard normal distribution. In this case, we would get uh, 500 false positives because this is uh, 0.05 times the total number of voxels which is 10,000. So we're going to get this salt and pepper pa pattern where white indicates that, that, that some, something was above the threshold and black indicates that it was below. So in this case we're not really controlling very well for false positives because we're doing uh, so what we need to do is a more stringent way. So we have approximately 500 false positives here so to control the family-wise error rate at, at 0.05, the Bonferroni correction would, be, would have to be at 0.05 divided by 10,000. So we have to control for the fact that we're doing 10,000 tests. 
And so if we do that, now the threshold, instead of being 1.645, is now equal to 4.42. So it's a much more stringent amount of evidence that needs for us to reject the null hypothesis. And if we do this, we get no false positives at all. So indeed, if we were to repeat this sort of simulation 100 times, on average, only five out of every 100 generated data sets would have one or more values above u. And so, so basically, the, 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 the probability of us getting any false positives among the 10,000 tests is only 5%. So we'd have to do this whole exercise 100 times, uh, and only once out of every 20 would we get one or more false positives. So this is a very, very stringent control over the false positive rate. And so, of course, this is really great if you're worried about getting false positives. However, if you, ha if you have true activations in this grid, it's going to be very hard to detect them. So there's sort of a trade-off here between uh, the ability to detect activations and control of family-wise error rates. So this is going to be a very stringent way. And so we're going to wind up losing a lot of activations if we use the Bonferroni correction. So the Bonferroni correction, as I just mentioned, is very conservative. It results in very strict significance levels. So this leads to a decrease in the power of the test, and this is the probability of cor correctly rejecting a false null hypothesis, and greatly increases the chance of getting false negatives. And so in general, it's also not optimal for correlated data, and most fMRI data has significant spatial correlation. So the number of independent tests are actually much fewer than the number of voxels. So we may be able to choose a more appropriate threshold by using information about the spatial correlation present in the data. And so one way of doing this is to use random field theory. So random field theory allows one to incorporate the correlation in spatial correlation into the calculation of the appropriate threshold. And it's based on approximating the distribution of the maximum statistic over the entire image. So what does this mean? Well, what's the link between the family-wise error rate and the maximum statistic? Well, the family-wise error rate is the probability of getting a family-wise error. So this is the probability that any of these t, t values, t statistics, exceeds u under the null hypothesis. So now I want to claim that this is equal to the, max, the probability that the maximum t statistic is above u. Because if the maximum is above u, then there is a, a, a t statistic that is above the threshold. If the maximum statistic is below u, then there is, by default, no test statistics that are above u because the, ma the maximum is the biggest value. So if we're interested in the probability of any t, t statistic exceeding u, it's enough for us to look at the probability that the max t statistic exceeds u under the null. So if you want to control the family-wise error rate, we simply need to find the distribution for the max, t, the max t statistic and threshold using that. So we choose the threshold u, such as the max, only exceeds it alpha percent of the time. So how do we do that? Well, random th field theory is one way of approximating the, the, the tail of the max statistic. And so a random field is a set of random variables defined at every point in some d-dimensional space. In our case, it's usually a three-dimensional space of the brain. And so we're mostly working with what's called Gaussian random fields. And so a Gaussian random field has a Gaussian distribution or a normal distribution at every point in every collection of points. And so a Gaussian random field is like any normal distribution defined by its mean and covariance. So the mean, in this case, it's the mean function and the covariance function. And so what we do in, in neuroimaging is we consider a statistical image, the one with all the t-statistics, to be a lattice representation of a continuous random field. And using random field methods, we're able to approximate the upper tail of the maximum distribution, which is the part we need in order to find the appropriate threshold. And also, simultaneously, we can account for the spatial dependence inherent in the data. And so that's a useful thing in the neuroimaging context. Let's consider that we have some, a random field Z of S defined on some space. And in, this, in our example, let's just assume that it's a two-dimensional space. And so here we have the random field. And in, 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 on, on the left, we see sort of a heat map of the, of the random field. And on the right, we see a mesh plot of it. And so these are just basically we have into every spot in the two-dimensional lattice, we have some statistic value uh, that follows a, a random field. So when we work with random field theory, we, we have to define something called the Euler characteristic. So the Euler characteristic is the property of a random field of an image after it's been thresholded. 
So basically what the Euler characteristic does in layman's terms is it counts the number of blobs, so the number of coherent areas, uh, minus the number of holes. And at the high threshold, it just counts the number of blobs. So what does this mean, number of blobs, number of holes? Well, let's look at the random field that we have here to the left. And let's say that we threshold it at the value u equal to 0.5. And that means that any value that's above 0.5 we set equal to 1, and anything below uh, 0.5 we set equal to 0. Then we get the map on the right top here, and which is just you know a lot of white within the black there. And so here the Euler characteristic is going to be 27, because there's 28 coherent islands of activation here, which I'm calling blobs. And there's one hole. You see in the bottom, there's a, there's a slight uh, hole in, in one of the blobs. And so it's going to be 27 different uh, 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 blobs minus holes. And so that's the Euler characteristic in that case. If we go to the middle one, here we're thresholding at 2.75. In this case, we only get two blobs and no holes. So the Euler characteristic is 2. Finally, if we go to u equal to 3.5, we can get a single blob and the Euler characteristic is 1. Okay, so the Euler characteristic is a property of this image after we thresholded it. So how do we use the Euler characteristic to control for the family-wise error rate? They seem to be very far removed from each other. Well, it turns out that, so we, we, we've already determined that there's a link between the family-wise error rate and the max t statistic. So the family-wise error rate is equal to the probability that the max t statistic is above u. I claim that if the max statistics is above u, that we're going to have one or more blobs, right? Because if we're thresholding at u, we're going to have one or more areas that are that, that are going to be white, you know, that are going to be deemed significant. Uh, and, and so in this case, basically, if the max statistic is above u, we're going to have one or more blobs. And let's just assume for sake of argument that no holes exist. In this case, we're actually interested in the probability that the Euler characteristic is, a, is, is bigger than or equal to 1. That means that we have one or more blobs. If we assume that there's never more than one blob, then this probability is approximately equal to the expected Euler characteristic. So now we have that the, the link between the family-wise error rate and the Euler characteristic. So the family-wise error rate is actually just the expected Euler characteristic. Now, this seems to have complicated the problem a lot, because why would we want to, how would we know what the expected Euler characteristic is? Well, the good news is that actually closed form results exist for the expected Euler characteristic for Z, T, F, and chi-squared continuous random fields. So we can kind of stand on the shoulders of the people that have already derived these results and use them to control the family-wise error rate. So for three-dimensional Gaussian random fields, the, this is a result for the expected Euler characteristic. It takes this somewhat complicated formula uh, where R is V over the full width max, half maximum in each of X, Y, and Z direction. So V is the volume of the search region, so the number of voxels basically that we're searching over, and the full width at half maximum represents the smoothness of the image estimated from the data in each direction. So R is sometimes in, in the nomenclature called a resolution element or resol. So basically, using this result, we can find that for large U, the family-wise error rate is roughly equal to this. So we can choose a threshold U to control the family-wise error rate. And so what are some properties of this equation? Well, as u increases, as the threshold increases, you can see that the family-wise error rate will decrease if, if u is large. So that's a good thing, because if, if we make the threshold more stringent, the family-wise error rate should go down. So this is a useful property. Similarly, as v increases, so the number of voxels that we're, we're, we're controlling for increases, the family-wise error rate will set also increase. And this is, this is, again, a useful property because the more tests that we're comparing simultaneously, the more likely they are to, to make a family-wise error. Finally, as the smoothness increases, then the family-wise error, family error rate will decrease. And this is, again, a useful property because if we have a very smooth image, we'd expect adjacent voxels to behave similarly and will have less independent tests. So even though this formula looks kind of ugly and, and, and hard to grasp, it has a lot of properties that are useful for controlling the family-wise error rate. So what are some assumptions that we need to hold in order to use this random field theory? Well, we have to assume that 
the entire image is either a multivariate Gaussian or derived from some multivariate Gaussian image. And so that includes chi-square, T, and F distribution. So those are the kind of distributions that we're often interested in working with. The statistical image must also be sufficiently smooth to approximate a continuous random field. And so the family-wise error rate has to be at least twice the voxel size. And so typically family-wise error rates, this, we want the smoothness to be at least three to four voxel sizes to, for this to work really well. And also the amount of smoothness is assumed to be known. And if the estimate can be biased when the images are not su sufficiently smooth. Also, as we saw when deriving these, these results, that there are several layers of approximations that have to be made. So that's the end of this module where we talked about two different methods for controlling the family-wise error rate. The first is the classic von Ferroni correction. Uh, which winds up being a little bit conservative because it doesn't take its spatial relationships into consideration. And then we also talked about random field theory, which is probably the most popular way of controlling for the family-wise error rate in uh, neuroimaging. Uh, uh, and, uh, and this controls a little bit for the spatial smoothness. In the next module, we'll talk about another type of way for con uh, controlling for, for multiple comparison, which is the false discovery rate. Okay, I'll see you then.